Uh, greetings, students. So we have spoken about the first appearance, right? We have spoken about, let's start with consultations, right? It is important that you consult thoroughly with your, with your client, right? That first consultation is very, is, is very important, is extremely important. During this consultation, the attorney must first of all establish the reason why he is being approached by the client. Right? You need to, uh, to establish those reasons. Why, why do you want me to be involved in your case? Right? The client might give certain reasons that have heard that you are good with criminal cases or I think you are the one who's going to help me in this case, right? Or I just need clarity, right? Okay. Um, as I have just pointed out in the discuss discussion before this, that uh, persons may approach attorneys for various reasons, ranging from merely seeking advice on whether certain proposed conduct constitutes an offense or not, that to, just to check if what he, he thinks he has done or what he's accused you constitutes an offense. I've told you that for every offense to be uh, admitted in a, in a court of law, all the elements of that crime should be present. For instance, I gave you an example of murder, that murder should be an unlawful and intentional killing of a human being, not of an animal, of a human being that is murder. Once all those elements are present, then you know the person is um, um, uh, must be accused of murder. So the the client will be coming for that for that for that explanation. Say somebody dies, and you feel guilty that it must have been your fault because you 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 forgot to give him uh, pills, and you feel that this is a crime. You go to an attorney, attorney and tell him, no, it's not your fault. Then it's just that you were just negligent. You should have remembered. But did you have a duty to to give that person uh, pills? No, you did not. And then that's not a crime. It was negligence on on your part. That's why you are feeling guilty. And it could have been negligence on um, on the part of the person of the deceased himself, right? So um, so the. the the, the client will come to you for assistance, right, uh, uh, in that regard. Or else he might come to you to uh, advise him as to how he can go about laying char charges against other people or to represent the accused at the trial, right? He might be coming to you to for advice as to how to go about laying charges or how you can represent a person who has been accused of having committed an offense, right? So you need to establish those before you even start. If the same person says murder, you must first ask them, what was your purpose? Why do you come to me? What do, how do you want me to help? But like I, I rem remember I said, the person must first pay before your call. consultation costs money. You can't be consulting for nothing. Once a person enters your door in your office, that person should have already paid uh, consultation fees with your receptionist. Otherwise, you're going to be able, you're not going to be able to pay rent if you just help people for nothing. That's very important. You see, poor lawyers is because they did not listen to their lecturers when they told them that listen. Be professional. When somebody enters your office, uh, the person must first report to the receptionist. The receptionist must explain how it goes, how much is how much is a, a fee for consultation, how much is a fee for bail, depending on what uh, the business of uh, that uh, client is. A person might come to you and say um, he wants you to help. Um, him to have his relative released on bail. So now you need to you need to uh, 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 do your research into as far as um, the, uh, the many ways that can be used to secure release for a person who has been 
uh, incarcer incarcerated for whatever offense, right? Okay. And the question may arise, you know, in your test or an exercise in class where I will say, uh, explain or draft or perform all steps that are needed to secure the release of the accused person from custody, right? We can, we can do that. So you will do the steps as to what do you do to have somebody released from custody. Or else I might say, um, explain the circumstances when an accused person may be released on warning. Right? A person can be released on warning. So you need to go and do a research and find out what are the steps where a person can be released on warning. Say, for instance, a person is um, um, arrested for having stolen one suite from checkers. That is not a serious, serious offense. So that person can be released on warning. Okay. Also, I may say, um, explain the circumstances when an accused person may be released on bail. What is bail? You need to first understand bail, that is now bail in terms of section 60 of the Criminal Procedure Act. So you go and read the, uh, the, the, the uh, section 60 of the Criminal Procedure Act, like 51 of 1977. Right. Um, and I can also um, ask if you uh, to, to determine whether after hours bail is permissible in our law. Right. If somebody is arrested, say, uh, after four o'clock and the court is closed, can that person apply for bail? The answer is yes. What do you do in that circumstance? You arrange with the investigating officer. You also arrange with the uh, prosecutor and then you can arrange for a bail application to be to be done after hours that is after hours bail and it's quite it's a bit expensive right normally uh, attorneys will charge you six thousand rand for, for 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 bail application so even if now it's after hours it's going to involve a lot of people a lot of, of phone calls so it, it has to be more than normal okay and also there is something called police bail. You can get police bail, but the only person who is allowed to give police bail is a commissioned officer. In, pol in the police force, there are non-commissioned officers and commissioned officers. Commissioned officers are those whom when, you, when another police, policeman sees that particular police, he will come to attention and salute. Those are called commissioned officers. Those are the only people who are allowed to uh, give police bail. A sergeant, a constable, a warrant officer cannot give police bail. Maybe starting from the superintendent, which was called captain before, a major, a colonel, um, a brigadier, can give police bail. Right, so that's very important. Don't go there and talk to sergeants and give bail. That bail won't be recognized. You will have to uh, have that client of yours re-arrested uh, 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 re and sent to, to, to the cells because their bail was unlawful. Okay. And then... Um, um, also, we might say, um, discuss the powers of the court after granting the bail application. Now, court grants bail application. What are the powers that the court can impose on the applicant? Right. Um, what the court can do is to uh, uh, set up conditions, stringent conditions to secure the attendance of the accused in court. How do you do that? Uh, things like having the passport of the accused uh, given to the investigating officer and the accused given um, uh, conditions that uh, he must report to a, a particular police station, preferable a police station nearer to his place of abode, that is now where he stays. So you can, uh, the court can tell the, uh, the accused person that he must report at the police station once a week 
between five and six. So the person will go to the police station and then an entry will be made. There is a, a, there is a register in, in the police station. Uh, it's called bail condition. It's got a number, it's called bail condition. So once you get to the police station, once your, your client gets to the police station, the police will take out that bail condition book and he will then sign to say, I am still around, I have not uh, absconded. I am, you know, I am abiding by the uh, directives of the court that uh, I must come in and, and report. And also, you might uh, also tell the, uh, the, the, the applicant that whenever they are leaving that magisterial area, he needs to report to a police station or, or tell the investigating officer that I am arrested in this area in Mbangeni. I'm intending to go to Deben. That means I'll be another magistral area or district. So I am reporting that I'm leaving the district so that the IO may know so that whenever he's wanted, he'll know exactly where he is, where to find him. So those are the conditions, those are the power that court can uh, uh, impose on uh, the applicant if the person has been given bail. Right? Um, now, a question might come out as to say, we say, discuss whether uh, the record of the bail proceedings is admissible in a subsequent trial. It is very important that whatever you say in the bail, bail application, uh, be mindful that you cannot change your statement. You can't say uh, when the murder happens, when somebody shot. Uh, maybe the accomplice shot the at the disease you were there but you did not participate and the next thing when it comes to the main trial you say no when uh, uh, the disease was shot i was not at home i was in town that will prove you to be a, 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 a not a credible witness or you can uh, um, the court will might um, find you guilty because you have misled the court. That means you've got something to hide. So you need to be very careful because what, what will normally happen is that the bail application happens maybe three years before the trial. And when you get to the trial, you would have forgotten what you said during the bail application. And if the prosecutor is clever, he would go there and get the record the recordings of the of um, of the bail application and he, and hear what you said. If now you have changed your statement, because if you are doing an application uh, for bail, that statement is is done under oath. So you you can't make two different statements under oath. That is called um, perjury. You you can be charged for perjury, and your credibility in this case will be in doubt. So you need to make sure that you don't make two different sworn statements in the same trial. That amounts to perjury. So, so you need to, 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 to advise your clients that uh, they cannot do that. All right. Um, and also, um, uh, now let's come to the actual bail application. Now I will, I will uh, then discuss the manners in which you can apply for bail for your particular 